All right, hello everybody. Um, let me just turn my camera on quick so you can see my face at least once uh, before we get going. As Mariah said, uh, my name is Dr. Damon. I am a, one of the uh, rotating interns uh, this year here at IndieVet. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Again, sorry for the little delay. We had a little uh, technical mishap. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, that's a wrap, a review of bandage use uh, and placement. So we'll uh, start today's uh, lecture by um, reviewing uh, different wound classifications and wound preparation. Uh, the majority of this lecture is about uh, bandage placement and bandage material, uh, but with that comes with uh, wound management. Uh, we'll go along with indications of bandage use, the la layer materials, uh, bandage types and uses, casts, techniques for keeping bandages on, and then some monitoring um, advice. You didn't have to do that, Bubba. So beginning with classification of wounds, uh, the CDC has four different uh, classifications when it comes to wounds. They are more surgically based, uh, but they work well for wounds that we would see through the ER or in general practice as well. The first type of wound is a class one or a clean wound. Uh, these are surgical wounds where the GI, respiratory, or your genital tracts have not been entered. These would be things like an elective orthopedic surgery, like the uh, image of a TPLO that we have here. Class two or clean contaminated wounds uh, may enter the respiratory GI or your genital tracts, but it is under controlled conditions and there is minimal to no leakage at all. Uh, this would be something like an enterotomy or gastrotomy uh, that does not have GI leakage. <clears throat> Class three or contaminated wounds are fresh open wounds with broken sterile technique or leakage of GI content with non-purulent inflammation. So this would be something like GI surgery where there was leakage of GI content into the abdomen or uh, kind of more along the lines with uh, the rest of today's lecture, traumatic wounds, things like dog bite wounds, um, lacerations, things like that. And finally, class four wounds or dirty wounds. These are older traumatic wounds, uh, typically with devitalized tissue. Um, going along with the surgery aspect, it'd be something like a GI perforation um, but again, um, wounds that are uh, traumatic, like bite wounds, um, are often classified as dirty or infected, um, especially when they contain pus. Further classification that kind of goes hand in hand with that four class uh, grading system um, is uh, some contaminated wounds. Uh, contaminated wounds uh, have bacteria present on the wound surface. Again, that'd be like a immediately traumatic wound, um, like a dog bite. Colonized wounds contain bacteria um, that have begun to multiply on the wound surface, but have not outgrown the immune system yet. And finally, an infected wound, uh, bacteria levels have overwhelmed the immune system. Uh, wounds are considered infected after only six hours. Um, so it is imperative when it comes to things like traumatic wounds, whether it's a dog bite, a laceration getting caught on a fence, um, anything like that. Uh, that we treat these wounds as quickly as we can to help limit the amount of infection that is present. With these wounds comes some wound preparation prior to bandaging. Uh, the extent of preparation um, really comes down to uh, what, uh, what the wound is, where it's located, how long it's been, um, the, the state of the wound, is there necrotic tissue, is there discharge, things like that. Um, so this can be quite an extensive step in wound preparation, or it could be a uh, pretty simple uh, standard clip and clean kind of thing. So uh, when it comes to preparing your wounds, you want to aseptically clean them with uh, chlorhexidine scrub, sterile saline, um, iodine scrub, if, if the location is an issue like around the face, around the prepuce. You need to debride uh, non-vital tissues, um, get all that dead tissue out of the way. Um, ensure that the wound and surrounding area have been dried prior to bandage placement. A little bit more specifically when it comes to your clip and clean, um, these steps here um, are important to follow, whether this is just a small laceration that needing uh, to be clipped and cleaned um, or a much larger wound like a degloving injury. So you start off by protecting your uh, wound with some sterile gel. This helps keep fur and debris out of the wound while you're cleaning the rest of the area. 
Uh, you'll shave the fur around the wound um, and, and remove any dead or devitalized tissue. Flush the wound again with either chlorhexidine solution, sterile saline, um, or iodine. You'll clean tissues around the wound. Typically, uh, our hospital uses chlorhexidine scrub for this. Um, and then you'll dry the area around uh, where the bandage is going to be placed. We don't want to trap any excess moisture um, underneath the bandage tissue, or, uh, excuse me, underneath the bandaging. And this can lead to further tissue damage. All right, I'm moving letter wrong into bandage usage. Now there are a number of different uh, indications for bandages. Uh, things simply as uh, preventing contamination of open wounds, cleanliness of an already clean wound, like applying a, a small bandage over a surgical site, prevention of continued trauma, especially in things like a, a hot spot or um, previous surgical sites, stabilization of wound areas, particularly uh, when it comes to things like fractures or luxations or dislocations that need to be repaired. Bandages can help reduce bleeding by providing pressure um, and can provide additional healing benefits uh, through the different use of contact layers. And we'll be getting into these contact layers here shortly. Bandaging requires a lot of different materials, uh, some of which are pictured here. Uh, this next section and the bulk of this lecture will be going over the different types of bandaged materials from our initial contact layers, uh, some topical additives uh, that go along with those all the way through our outer layers of bandaged material. Beginning with the initial contact layers, they're all listed here. Um, there are a number of different types of layers for your different bandaging needs. Um, and these layers uh, will change depending on uh, the type of wound present um, and the stages of healing uh, the wound may go through. Uh, we'll be going through the, uh, the different materials here in order from driest wound to most wet wound. Uh, to help kind of uh, keep those things straight, uh, I've made this nice little chart here um, with the level of exudate uh, going from dry to high exudate um, with materials like uh, non-adhesive pads, your telfa pads, um, some xeriform and hydrogel being our low to uh, dry exudative wounds. Low to moderate um, is our hydrocolloids, followed by our hydrophilic foam and calcium alginates in our moderate to high exudate. Um, the adaptive stressing is listed on there by itself because its indication for use extends from um, all the way from dry to highly exudative wounds. So like I said, we'll start uh, with our dry uh, bandage materials. We'll start with the non-adherent pads. These are things like talpa pads or cotton pads. There are non-adherent pads are soft made up of absorbable cotton uh, with a permeable outer layer. Uh, they easily conform to wound shape and size, easily cut to shape as needed. These are excellent for dry to low exudative wounds and can be used to protect sensitive skin or areas where there is concern for potential damage uh, from bandage placement. Uh, the image um, on the left-hand side here um, is, a, is a limb that we'll be following uh, through uh, the bandaging process during this lecture. Uh, with the, uh, just for orientation's sake, this is a right forelimb. Um, the shoulder is down near that gloved hand, the blue hand in the bottom right corner. Uh, the foot extends up off the, the left side of the image there. This wound um, is right at the elbow um, and was actually secondary to an improperly placed bandage. Um, so uh, these talpa pads work great for supplying a little bit of extra support uh, when we rebandage this leg. Uh, there's no open wound, it's just very red and irritated. So we just place the talpa pad over the top to provide some extra bandage and extra padding. Um, like I said, uh, these non-adherent pads work best for lie, uh, dry, well, my apologies, <laughs> work best for dry to low exudative wounds. Next we have Xeriform dressing. Uh, Xeriform is designed to allow excess moisture to escape while keeping the wound from drying out completely and keeping materials from sticking to the wound as it dries. It is made up of, of a fine mesh gauze um, it contains uh, the chemical bismuth tribromophenate, uh, which is expected to have antimicrobial properties. Uh, but current research has been inconclusive with one study in humans showing that the common pathogens found in burn victims are not actually inhibited by the dressing alone, uh, but the dressing can help with these uh, antimicrobial uh, dressings. On a microscopic level uh, by the body's own white blood cells 
uh, by keeping the wound surface moist, but not too wet. These are great for dry to low exudative wounds um, and can be used in many situations such as burns, lacerations, abrasions, and skin grafts. Our final uh, dry to low exudative wound dressing is hydrogel. Hydrogels are dressings with a high fluid content that come in a variety of different forms, including sheets, gel impregnated dressings, and actual gels like the two pictured here. This product is designed to promote wound healing um, by rehydrating wounds and making an environment that promotes autolytic debridement. Again, this is by keeping the wound moist, but not too wet. Because it has such a high fluid content, it also provides a cooling effect on the wound that can help decrease inflammation and pain. Again, these are for dry to low exudative wounds, um, including burn wounds, dry wounds with a large surface area, and wounds with dry necrotic tissue. Next, we have our hydrocolloids. Uh, these come in a variety of forms as well, including pads, powders, and pastes, but they all serve the same general purpose. Uh, once they're exposed to fluid or exudate, they form a gel barrier that is impermeable to bacteria, gas, and fluids. Uh, when correctly used, this creates an ideal environment for autolytic debridement, again, keeping the wound moist um, and protecting it from uh, contaminants. Um, however, if the wound is not cleaned properly prior to application, this can create an anaerobic environment, uh, opening up the possibility of bacterial infections uh, that may be missed um, and can cause some damage depending on how long in between bandage changes. These are best for low to moderately exudative wounds, uh, such as lacerations, pressure sores, skin ulcers, um, and wounds with suspected necrotic tissue. Next is the hydrophilic foam. Uh, hydrophilic foam is a highly absorptive uh, wound dressing that absorbs exudate and promotes a moist, but again, not wet wound environment. This pad not only provides coverage to a wound um, with moisture absorption, but can also provide additional cushioning for extra protection. The foam is highly malleable and easy to cut and fit into a variety of wounds and locations. When used for absorption, uh, the foam is best used for moderate to highly exudative wounds, but like I said, this can be used for any wound type uh, really um, if just additional padding and protection is needed. Pain high amounts of exudate. The dry dressing, which is pictured in that bottom image, I apologize for the little glare in the photo, um, is similar to a coarse cloth-like material. However, once exposed to exudate and fluid, um, turned into a, a thick gel. Um, it can, uh, like it says on the slide there, absorb up to 20 times its weight in exudate. So these are great if you are expecting some highly exudative wounds. This allows for atraumatic removal of the dressing at time of bandage change, so not um, damaging any of the healing underlying tissue. And due to its structure, uh, the dressing is very pliable and can be cut to shape and pack into wounds of varying sizes. Calcium alginate also promotes autolytic debridement by providing calcium ions um, in the dressing itself um, to aid in hemostasis. Like I said, these are good for moderate to highly exudative wounds, such as uh, deep tunneling wounds, dehiscent surgical sites, um, or highly exudative skin wounds. Finally, we have our adaptix dressing. This is a non-adherent primary layer uh, made up of a petroleum-based uh, product. Uh, this allows the dressing to uh, be easily removed at time of bandage change um, without sticking the wound bed underneath um, or the surrounding tissues. Uh, it, is a net, it is designed to promote healing um, and prevent sticking, again, promoting autolytic debridement by keeping the wound moist, uh, but not wet. That's a very common theme um, I'm sure you've seen uh, over all these dressings here, uh, keeping the wound surface moist, but not too wet, um, allowing for easy removal of the bandaged material without damaging the underlying tissues. As I stated earlier, this adaptive dressing is good for dry to highly exudative wounds, um, things like burns, lacerations, abrasions, skin grafts, and surgical sites. So that covers all of our uh, initial contact layers. Again, here's that chart now that we've gone over everything. 
um, showing those non-adherent pads, zeroform and hydrogel, dry to low exudate. Hydrocolloids with a low to medium exudate wounds um, and rounding out with the hydrophilic foam and calcium alginate for moderate to highly exudative wounds. And that adaptics being good for many situations. In addition to those initial contact layers, we have some topical additions. Uh, these things are uh, like Manuka honey, recruit powder, uh, antibiotics, and silver dressing. We'll get into these each more over the next couple of slides here. To start off with honey, um, Manuka honey or honey it's, uh, itself uh, forms a protective barrier uh, over the wound that prevents bacterial growth and promotes healing. Uh, due to its components, um, it creates a low pH environment, uh, which can uh, damage bacteria uh, or just make a hostile environment for bacteria. The low pH also increases oxygen release into the tissues, uh, which promotes healing. The high sugar content and low water content uh, creates um, an osmotic pull, uh, pulling water out of bacteria, resulting in crenation or shriveling up the bacteria, uh, making a non-suitable environment. Uh, but this also pulls fluids um, and nutrients from deeper tissues, uh, providing the healing wound surface with nutrients that it needs to heal properly. This also helps by keeping the wound hydrated. Specifically, when it comes to Manuka honey, uh, Manuka honey contains a chemical called methylglyoxal um, that is a component unique to Manuka honey um, and uh, comes from the Manuka plant uh, that is found in Southeast Australia, Australia and New Zealand. It is important to note though, that when using honey and Manuka honey, uh, you have to use medical grade honey only. You can't just go to the store and buy um, some honey off the shelf in the baking section uh, to use for bandages. It has to be medical grade only. Uh, medical grade honey has been uh, specifically formulated um, and sterilized to prevent any accidental contamination. When using honey, there's a large doctor uh, variance between how often they like to change these bandages. Uh, some doctors prefer to change a bandage that contains honey uh, the next day um, and others uh, being okay with pushing these bandage changes out to about every three days. So really it comes down to the doctor's preference as to how often uh, bandages with honey need to be changed. As a little side note, um, honey um, has very similar properties to sugar here. Um, so if medical grade honey is not something uh, you have readily available when you are bandaging some wounds that you think could benefit from honey, you can actually just go to the store and buy some uh, regular table sugar. It has the same general properties as honey um, and can aid in wound healing in a pinch. Recruit powder um, is a powdered extracellular matrix um, that aids in healing by providing a scaffolding for new cells and tissue uh, to grow over your wound area. This allows for faster capillary growth and thereby faster wound healing. It does come from uh, porcine or pig collagen uh, from small intestinal mucosa and helps uh, to remodel into va vascularized tissue um, throughout the healing process. It can be used in a number of different wound types, um, including partial full thickness wounds, ulcers, undermined wounds, surgical wounds with large surface areas, such as grafts um, and traumatic wounds. This is an image taken from the Recruit Powder's informational handout that can be found online. Um, the image on the left is a degloving injury that was sustained by a cat. Uh, Recruit Powder was used in this study regularly during bandaging process. Um, and after about two months, um, that large wound um, has been reduced out to just a small scab. We use it quite frequently in our hospital um, when we are dealing with uh, large wounds that just aren't healing uh, quite as quickly as we'd like them to. Next are some antibiotics. Um, these are pretty commonplace. Uh, topical antibiotics provide broad spectrum coverage um, and come in a variety of forms, um, including gels, um, ointments, impregnated dressings, and powders. They can help keep wounds moist in the uh, in the form of an ointment um, if necessary, if you have a dry wound, um, or like the bottle on the right, um, that is a, a powdered antibiotic that is often used um, in things like between the toes where we might have some moist dermatitis, help keep the wound dry actually. And then finally, uh, we have the silver dressing. Uh, it provides antimicrobial action against many uh, different 
different types of organisms by disrupting its cell membrane permeability, damaging bacterial cell walls, and disrupting enzyme and protein activity. Now that we've got our initial layers down, we'll be getting into uh, the bulk of putting on bandages, um, the more labor intensive portion. We'll be following uh, this particular limb along through bandaging process. Uh, this is the limb we looked at earlier, just for some orientation. Um, and I recognize that the image on the screen now um, is upside down, um, but this is so that it fits best with the orientation of the rest of the bandaging images um, for the remainder of this lecture. Um, so the shoulder of the dog is up on the top of the image where that glove is. The foot is hanging off the bottom of the picture. Uh, that large wound is at about the wrist area or the carpus of, uh, of this dog. Uh, and then you, again, you can see that abrasion at the elbow point. So we'll be following this leg along um, as we go through the rest of our bandaging. So now that we have our contact layer on um, with either our uh, telfa pads. Um, in this particular wound, we used um, some telfa pads, some hydrophilic foam, and some manuka honey. Um, we'll be moving along to our secondary layer. Uh, this provides the first layer of compression to our wound and provides the first layer of additional support to our wound. It pads the wound, absorbs tissue fluid, um, and is a great way to, uh, like I said, provide your initial layer of compression. Uh, this typically is made up of cast padding or roll cotton, depending on what you've got in your hospital. Um, and when you place this, you need to make sure that you overwrap, uh, overlap um, each layer by about 50% with even pressure to ensure that you've got a nice steady pressure across the length of your limb, um, in this case, um, to prevent any um, issues with circulation um, or swelling. What's nice about this roll cotton uh, or cast padding is that it's too, uh, you cannot make it too tight when wrapping a leg. Um, since it is just cotton, um, as you start pulling on the cotton as you're wrapping the leg, um, you can act, uh, the cotton will actually just tear um, if you start wrapping it too tightly. So it's very easy to get a nice um, steady compression around uh, the leg as you wrap. When you're wrapping um, legs, whether this is the secondary layer here or the layers that we'll get onto further um, in this lecture, it's important to wrap um, from just a little proximal or starting from the foot and wrapping your way up. This helps push any swelling or edema up further in the leg and ensures that you've got an even steady pressure um, beginning at the lowest point or where uh, the most pressure will build up distally uh, just due to gravity. The next layer provides the bulk of the compression of our bandage and work. When it legs or body wraps and provides the pressure um, around the, the wound and surrounding areas. Even pressure is uh, just as important in this layer um, as well. The image on the left um, is our uh, limb wrapped with just the cast padding on. You can see it's nice, big, and fluffy. Um, and the image on the right is after a few layers of cling wrap. Again, overlapping uh, this layer with about 50% over, overlap. As you can see the image on the right, uh, it is nice and smooth. Obviously we've got a little bump out where we've got some extra padding from our contact layers underneath, um, but the overall uh, shape of the bandage is nice and smooth. This lets us know that we have a nice steady pressure across the bandage um, and that we're not gonna have any um, issues uh, with uneven pressure or ischemia anywhere um, underlying. An incorrectly wrapped bandage um, on a limb like this will give the leg almost like a Michelin man style appearance. It'll have uh, bump outs, um, areas will be thicker than others uh, because the cotton padding is not as nice and compact down underneath. Like I said, uneven pressure with this, whether it's too tight or too loose can cause pressure sores or pressure changes across the bandage that could result in pressure sores, um, uncomfortable uh, bandaging uh, for the patient. Um, and things like that that we just want to avoid. Finally, for our outer layer, um, there are a number of different types of outer layer materials chosen uh, based on uh, what you need for the bandage, uh, which type of bandage you're doing, um, where the bandage is located, things like that. The outer layer protects the bandage um, and the underlying wounds from the environment, provides additional support, and can be uh, made from a number of different materials, including uh, water resistant uh, drape material, uh, vet wrap and elastic tape like you can see in the bandage um, here. 
things like Tegaderm, Ioban, or Hypofix. Uh, some, <clears throat> uh, some of these layers you may use more of, like you can see we've got both the elastic tape and vet wrap um, on this leg here. Uh, and not all bandages will have the same number of, of layers um, or the same materials used at all times. Um, as patients are seen over several weeks for bandage changes, the layers used, the materials used, especially when it comes to the contact layer and wound progression, uh, may change uh, based on the wound needs and patient needs. To kind of wrap everything up on our material side of things, um, here's a list um, of our contact layers. Um, again, being that non adherent pads are telpha, xeriform, hydrogel, hydrocolloids, adaptics, hydrophilic foam, calcium alginate, and then along with those topical additives like manuka honey and antibiotics. Secondary layer is made up of our cast padding or roll cotton. Tertiary layer, uh, things like uh, cling wrap if we're wrapping a limb or a body, uh, body wrap. Um, gauze can be used as a tertiary layer as well for doing things like a tie over bandage, which we'll touch on um, here shortly. And then our, our outer layer material, great material, vet wrap with elastic tape, Tegaderm, Ioban, and Hypofix. And just so we can see everything uh, kind of step by step here as it's placed. Again, that top left image is our initial uh, leg with the wound. The next image um, shows our first layer of roll cotton on. Typically we do about three layers of roll cotton wrapping again from the foot um, up to the shoulder. In this case, we went just above the elbow um, to incorporate that elbow wound um, and make sure that our bandages are gonna slide down. Uh, the third image um, on the top there is our three layers of roll cotton. The last image on the top right um, is after our cling wrap. And then the bottom two images are the vet wrap with the elastic tape on the bottom. So we're gonna talk about today as well um, with the uh, Robert Jones or modified Robert Jones being the first one we'll touch on, followed by body wraps, a tie over bandage. We'll touch briefly on casts and splints and then uh, specifically the spica splint. So the Robert Jones or modified Robert Jones bandage is the kind of bandage that we placed um, on the, the images that we watched or we went through for the bandaging here uh, with the one on the top right. Specifically, that was a modified Robert Jones. A Robert Jones bandage is an image um, on the left-hand side. The difference between a Robert Jones and the modified version is that the modified bandage has less cotton padding, uh, making the bandage smaller in size and easier for an animal to handle. This type of bandage provides compression to help alleviate swelling either secondary to a wound or trauma or post-operatively, uh, and can be used to temporarily stabilize fractures. They're often used with splints uh, when conservative fracture management is elected uh, or when additional stability is required after a surgery. When used for fracture stabilization, they're only effective for fractures below the level of the elbow or the knee. Um, as uh, this large, uh, even if with the modified Robert Jones, uh, the material is still heavy. Um, and just based on uh, the, the way forces work in the legs, um, we cannot use these for fractures of the humerus uh, or the femur um, as they do not provide support to those bones. If incorrectly placed on these fractured limbs, uh, the weight of the bandage can put extra strain on the, on the um, distal portion of the fracture, resulting in unnecessary pain and discomfort to our patients. Body wraps um, are another common uh, bandage type we often use. Uh, these can be used to cover wounds on either the abdomen or the thorax, uh, or used to cover and secure things like drains as in the image here. These wraps are applied in the same manner as other bandages, utilizing cotton, cling, and an outer layer such as vet wrap. These bandages can be difficult to keep in place, so it is important that when you wrap these, you, all, you need, often need to incorporate the nearest limb, whether that's the forelimb or a back limb, uh, to help hold the bandage in place and prevent sliding. Although with wrapping these, it is important to make sure that these wraps are not tight, uh, wrapped too tightly especially around the chest, as we don't want to prevent uh, chest expansion during breathing. When these wraps are applied correctly, the patient should still be able to breathe comfortably, and you should be able to fit a finger or two between the patient and the body wrap. 
but it should still be tight enough that it provides the protection and coverage that you are intending it for. Tie over bandages um, are for wounds not amenable to uh, your typical wrap or pressure bandages or for patients that may not tolerate a body wrap. For this bandage type, a ring of sutures is placed around an area that needs to be covered. Um, as I've outlined on that right image with those black bars, uh, the sutures themselves were just too difficult to see in the images unless I blew the image way up. Um, and then the rest of the image was just blurry. Um, so we've got, I've outlined it with those bars there. Ring of stay sutures. The bandage material is then just stacked on top of itself over the open wound. Um, just like you would any other layer or under any other bandage, you start with your primary contact layer. <clears throat> this is where your uh, third, second or third layer may just consist of gauze to help absorb extra fluid. And so there's nothing to wrap cling around in this situation. And then you would finish off with a fluid repellent outer layer, um, something like a surgical drape um, or your adhesive outer layers like Ioban. Um, tying things um, into your uh, tie bandage to secure them to your patient. Uh, one method is seen on that left image where you use umbilical tape and just run a crisscrossing pattern across the top of your bandage uh, through your stay sutures that were previously placed. The other method just involves taking some suture um, and you go along the edges of your uh, bandage and incorporate the edge of your drape or your bandage uh, material into your stay sutures. So instead of having the crisscross pattern across uh, the top of your bandage. You just have sutures running along the edges um, and it makes almost like a little muffin top that kind of is sutured in place on top, of, uh, on top of the wound. An easy addition to some bandaging um, is uh, cast and splints. Um, we're gonna touch briefly on this since that is something that um, a lot of people can do whether that's in the ER setting or a uh, GP setting. They can be used to temporarily stabilize fractures and dislocations to help alleviate pain and discomfort of patients uh, awaiting surgery. Um, it can be used as definitive care in some fractures and dislocations where surgery may not be indicated or not possible. Casts and splints are made up of a couple of different materials. Um, ideally, they're made specifically for the patient, and that is where fiberglass and thermoplastics like Hexalite come into play. Fiberglass, the image on the bottom left there, um, can be rolled around the limb, uh, just like the underlying bandage material, to make multiple layers uh, to the thickness that is desired uh, for that particular splint um, or cast. Thermoplastics, like Hexlite, the uh, white material on top right, comes in rolls or sheets and is used similar to the fiberglass, and then it can either be rolled around um, or cut to size. Um, more specifically, or more, uh, Hexlite is more often used uh, as a, as a single-sided splint uh, where the fiberglass can be used for a uh, single directional splint, so like a, a caudal splint or a lateral splint, um, or you can wrap an entire leg, um, cut that in half, and then you have both a cranial and caudal splint, uh, lateral medial, depending on what, what your situation is. However, the Hexlite is weaker um, than fiberglass and is best used for cats and small dogs, um, even when layered, um, it does not have the same structural strength uh, that layered fiberglass does. So when it comes to larger patients, uh, like your medium to larger dogs, uh, fiberglass is the preferred uh, splint material of choice. But then uh, we also have our prefabricated splints. Um, these come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Uh, but may be difficult to get a patient to fit in correctly and comfortably uh, to, and provide them with appropriate padding. Um, so these are not recommended for long-term use. Of course, short-term use if necessary, um, just to alleviate uh, some of the discomfort from something like a fractured leg. Uh, but then transitioning to something like a fiberglass or thermoplastic splint um, is, would be ideal in that situation. Along with casting and splinting, it's important to uh, recognize the need for post-splinting uh, radiographs. Uh, it's important to take some x-rays post-splinting. Uh, this was a dog that was hit by a car, had a uh, tibia fibula fracture. As you can see, it's uh, displaced in that left image. That leg is, or the bones are uh, not quite positioned appropriately. After casting, uh, we were 
able to confirm that we do have a adequate alignment, a realignment of the bones there um, so that they will heal properly or at least uh, better than they would um, without proper alignment. Um, without proper alignment, we can lead to uh, pain, discomfort, um, and non-healing uh, fractures in our patients. And then finally, we have our spica splint. Uh, spica splints are used when stabilization is needed above the elbow or the knee. They're the most common form of external coaptation or support uh, that works for these types of fractures. <coughs> these bandages are placed beginning at the distal part of the limb um, or down by the foot, just like a Robert Jones bandages. Uh, but when they are, uh, when the top of the limb is reached, uh, the thorax or the pelvis is incorporated into the bandage as well. This prevents movement of the hip or the shoulder joint, helping to stabilize the fracture. These are applied just like any other cast is, uh, with the padding uh, layer being applied first, followed by your clean compression, and then your splint material as can be seen in the right image. When properly placed, the animal should not be able to move uh, at the shoulder or the hip that is wrapped, and should have to walk, they'll walk almost like a little peg leg um, gait or kind of swing that leg around um, in order to move. Uh, when wrapping a pelvic spica on a male patient, it is also important to make sure that they're able to properly urinate without getting the bandage wet or dirty. Um, if they continue to urinate on the bandage, um, if necessary, the bandage may need to be replaced, repositioned so that the patient can urinate without getting the bandage dirty because a dirty bandage needs to be changed. A couple of tips for keeping bandages in place. Um, things like tape stirrups, the top left picture there. Um, can help prevent bandages from sliding. These are placed by applying tape to either side of the leg, a lower leg, like in this image. Um, with your tape tails hanging off, um, it is easiest to just secure the tape tags then to a popsicle stick to prevent them from sticking to other things. You'll then place your bandage material like you normally would. And after you have placed your cling layer, um, or if you're incorporating it into a splint, after your splints have been placed, you'll separate the ends of your, your tape tabs that are on the popsicle stick um, and then wrap them back on themselves and stick them back onto the, the cast material or the cling wrap. This just helps, uh, is one thing that can help prevent sliding of your, of your bandage. E-collars are also important. Um, it doesn't do you any good to place a, a wonderfully beautiful bandage if the patient's just going to chew the bandage off right away. Um, so e-collars uh, are excellent tools uh, whether the patient is staying in hospital for some time or going home, uh, it's important to remind owners that the, the e-collars need to stay on um, so that way the bandages um, don't become damaged or ruined, um, necessitating um, increased costs to the owners through uh, more frequent bandage changes um, or um, worst case scenario, something like a potential foreign body if a dog or a cat were to, to ingest too much of this bandage material. When uh, taking patients with casts, uh, limb casts or bandages outside, whether it's in a hospital or at home, it's important to cover the end of the wrap to prevent them from getting wet or dirty. Um, you can use things like old fluid bags, the Medipaw, like the, the one pictured here, uh, or saran wrap or plastic bags. Um, these help keep the cast nice and dry when you take them outside. It's just important to remember um, and to remind owners that after the dog or cat comes back inside, um, I guess more so for dogs, unless you've got a very well-trained cat to go outside, um, more so for these dogs. If they stay on uh, while inside, um, this can cause the, the limbs to, to heat up a little bit more, uh, create excess moisture, um, and can damage the underlying tissues. Along with this, uh, when you have patients in the hospital who have uh, bandages on their limbs, do not put water bowls in their kennels. Um, we've had just in, in my hospital alone, we've had a number of patients who they get a bandage placed, a water bowl gets put in their kennel, and then they are standing in the water bowl. And wet and damaged casts need to be changed. It makes extra work for everybody um, and has additional costs um, and just can be a hassle, especially if you need to sedate a patient to place a bandage. And that's where that final point comes in. Use sedation is needed. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't do you any good to fight with the patient 
uh, and try to do a bandage without sedation <clears throat> just to have the bandage fall off shortly after because the bandage was incorrectly placed uh, because the animal was fighting it too much. As for monitoring, uh, check your bandages regularly for strike through, um, whether they're wet damaged, excessively dirty, again, strike through, um, properly placed, or if there's any odor. It's important to remind your owners to do this as well, um, as any of those things uh, need, can be any of those things necessitate uh, a bandage change or could indicate issues as well, uh, particularly if you've got something like a bad odor coming from the bandage. When you are able So if the toes are visible, uh, check regularly to ensure that there's no swelling um, or color changes. Uh, we'll touch briefly on toes on the next slide here. Um, again, um, with this limb that we've been kind of following through this lecture, um, that the large wound on the wrist on the, on the bottom portion of this picture uh, was, was from a traumatic event, but the smaller wound at the elbow, the one indicated by the orange arrow, was secondary to poor bandage placement. Um, so that's a wound that could have been avoided um, had the bandage been properly placed. But it is important to note that pressure sores um, can occur with bandages even when properly placed, um, but they can be managed and stopped from worsening with appropriate wound care and uh, a little bit of extra padding uh, on the next bandage change. As for bandage changes, it's important that they are uh, done routinely and on an as uh, as needed basis for that particular patient and then whatever particular wound you're dealing with. Um, some bandages need to be changed daily and others are good for something like two weeks. Like if you're dealing with a post-surgical splint that is simply just providing additional support to a leg. As for toes, uh, when limbs are wrapped, uh, the foot needs to be wrapped as well. Uh, the nails of digits three and four or the two middle toes should be visible and paw pads should be palpable within the bandage, but not visible. Incorrectly wrapped feet and legs um, can lead to swelling and ischemic damage um, or, or circulatory issues um, within the foot itself. So this image here uh, is a nicely wrapped foot. Um, you can even see the tape stirrups that they have um, that are providing additional uh, support to that bandage. You can just see the nails starting to poke out and you can feel the, the paw pads inside. This foot um, is an incorrectly wrapped foot. Uh, the bandage does not go down far enough. You can see that the, the toes are actually bulging around um, the end of the bandage there. Uh, so we don't want that. I see now that we're coming, uh, I have a little case example to go through, but I see now that we're um, coming up on uh, just about 50 minutes here. Um, so we'll just kind of skim through this quickly. Uh, this was a five-month-old uh, female Labrador that originally presented for fracture stabilization. Uh, but about a week after surgery, the owners noticed some discharge and some odor coming from the bandage. Um, it's difficult to see in the image, but this is uh, the image the owner sent. Uh, that center area of the visible foot, um, the pink area there, was starting to have some yellow discharge with it. So they came in, had the bandage removed that same day, um, and this is what was found. Um, and there is, uh, this dog unfortunately suffered um, some sort of reaction to the bandage material, resulting in um, some pretty severe swelling um, and discharge and wounds to that foot. So here's that foot uh, four days after the, that initial bandage was removed. Uh, this foot has been con was continually bandaged throughout this whole process, but <clears throat> in rechecks, we are able to see the kind of progression of, of wound healing um, and bandaging. So at this point, um, the um, limb was bandaged again using honey and calcium alginate dressing. Uh, both of these things helping uh, provide uh, additional healing benefits um, to the foot. And as we can see, I'll kind of get through these quickly here so we can get to any questions if we have any. Um, after uh, six days, eight days, we're seeing some uh, a lot of healing, um, but this the wound itself is still progressing, um, particularly uh, as you can see on this image, the kind of dark brown area underneath that 
nice bright red, is actually some exposed necrotic bone. Um, so the uh, dog went to second surgery to have um, those, the necrotic bone amputated. But that red tissue, that bright red, is actually healthy granulation tissue. All right, so we'll just keep scrolling along here quick. Uh, look at these last images to look at all this wound healing. Um, and it can take, what I want to stress with this, um, with this case example is just notice the amount of time that it's taking. So this dog, after 54 days um, or almost uh, two months here after the initial presentation, um, we are still dealing with um, these wounds healing up. Um, so wound healing does take time. Um, but it's something that with proper uh, bandage etiquette, uh, proper care from both the veterinary uh, staff and the owners um, can be quite beneficial. You can see the kind of the fruits of your labor here as, as things heal up um, and heal well. Now we'll just finish up with our take home points here. So it is important to appropriately clean wounds prior to bandaging to prevent any um, unnecessary infection. Selected contact layers uh, are based on a patient's needs and often change throughout the bandaging uh, process and the wound healing process. When you're wrapping things like a limb or a body wrap, make sure to overlap your layers by at least 50% you know, each time around the leg. Wrap limbs, uh, a joint above and a joint below um, of where you need the, the wrap to be, especially, uh, this is especially important when it comes to splints and casts. Uh, it's important to prevent unnecessary movement of these things of of these joints um, when dealing with with fractures um, or dislocations. Uh, not so much so when it comes to just covering up wounds, um, but wrapping above the joints, like wrapping above the elbow when you have a lower arm issue, does help keep the bandage in place. Stirrups, e collars, and sedation are your friends for helping keep bandages in place. And if there are any ever concerns about the bandage, any concerns with underlying tissue, remove the bandage and replace it. Um, so that way you can do a full inspection um, as necessary. So I knew uh, that this is just a lecture um, and the, the best way to get better at placing bandages is to practice and do it. Um, so that's why I'm advertising here um, uh, next month. Uh, Dr. Russell White will be hosting a uh, bandaging lecture and lab bandaging splints and casts oh my um, that I would recommend anybody who would like some practice uh, placing bandages sign up for. And that is it for me this evening. I'm happy to take any questions there might be. I think I see one already in the chat. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Namont. Okay. So the first question we have is how common is allergies to bandage material? Sure. Um, so I don't have uh, a specific answer for you on that one. Um, this is the, that's the first one that I've seen. Um, granted, I've only been, been doing this for about a year or so, um, but the number of bandages that I've seen, that's the only one. Um, we think it was some sort of reaction to the tape, um, but we can't say for certain exactly what it was. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer for, for exactly how common those allergies are. Um, but the things that we use, uh, the most common bandaging materials um, are things like cotton um, and just roll gauze, uh, which are pretty non uh non-allergen, I guess I could say. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.